and assistant professor of art at New York University. His work has been exhibited at international venues, including Guggenheim Museum, Corcoran Gallery, and Whitney Museum of American Art, and is also regularly featured in publications such as the New York Times Magazine, Vibe, and New York. Chuck Close is an artist noted for his highly inventive technique used to paint the human face and best known for his large-scale photo-based portrait paintings. He's also an accomplished printmaker and photographer whose work has been exhibited in many solo and group exhibitions worldwide. He's a recipient of National Medal of Arts and honorary degrees from numerous institutions. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters and also serves on the President's Committee on the Arts and the Humanities. He's presented by Pace Gallery. Because we actually had a conversation about this work in its early stages. Um, it was in 99. Um, I began this project in 98, and um, it was in 99 that I think I showed, showed some of the work, and he had invited the um, author to be seen by Richard Klein, you know, the senior curate at the time, um, and come up with some work. So we actually had a conversation around the work at that time. So it's just, it's been interesting thinking of the last 10 years what some of the themes that came up in that particular discussion and what has happened over the last, over the, over the last, you know, 10 years. Um, this so. is um, mm -hmm. my grandparents, my Albertine Johnson and Joella Johnson. It was done in 94. It's my first time working in the Polaroid studio. So, um, um, this, I wanted to just show you a couple of photographs that my grandfather took. All of my grandfather was an economist at the Port Authority. He shot um, over, I think, that he was shooting at the chrome, at the chrome I think was discovered in 43 or mid 40s. He was shooting at the chrome as late as, um, as the Leica, as um, early as the late 40s. And he documented his friends and family, my, my parents, and then my brother and I, who's with us as well, the filmmaker Thomas Allen Harris, is this evening. So, um, <laughs> so this work, I would say, um, you know, I went to Wesleyan, I studied economics, and I um, started, my, 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 my experience with photography there was very much of a modernist notion of photography. It was when I got to Cal Arts that I got more exposed to, let's say, against the grain, sort of a critique of certain, certain kinds of representation. But I was always drawn to Sanders' um, body of work in terms of his, you know, synthesis of the 20th century, the encyclopedic, you know, um, cataloging, and that's something which I think was very influential to my work going on. Um, it, it's, you know, it's sort of punk, rude poly, at the same time, just the formal aggression. I'm just curious, I mean, what, what was going on for you at the time? What were you reacting to? I mean, what, what, tell us more about, you know, the period in which this image, you know, came about. Well, I was a uh, recently retired uh, junior abstract expressionist. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, by the time it's the fourth or fifth generation and it's taught in schools, it's as academic as uh, what you might find at the Art Students League, except it happens to be abstract and whatever. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd gotten all kinds of uh, rewards for demonstrating the fact that I knew what art looked like. Um, the trouble is it's got to look like someone else's art or it won't look like art. And uh, I just found myself in the studio, as many people do when they get out of graduate school, and there were all kinds of other people in that room with me, um, all my heroes, uh, but I couldn't find myself in the room, so I had to get and push all those other people out of the studio. And the easiest way to do it was to construct a series of... Uh, severe self-imposed limitations that while guaranteeing nothing in particular would at least keep me from making what I had made. So I just did the opposite of what I was doing. My work had very much about color, so I did a black, black and white. They were not objective, so I wanted to have an image. I had made shapes that looked like art. My hand just moved in cliche ways, made the cooling shapes or whatever. So I, I decided to work from photographs so that uh, it had to be the shape of an ear. It couldn't just be a handwriting shape. I was plagued with indecision, put it in, put it off, scrape it on, scrape it off. Uh, so I worked with only black paint on a white canvas to force me to make decisions early. Uh, I, uh, I, prior to this, I'd done a 22 foot long nude and uh, this was, it was still not big enough, even at 22 feet, so I decided to just blow up one part of the body, and I would have to be photographing the nude that day, turn the camera to myself, and took my own picture by measuring the distance between the lens with a piece of cardboard. Um, this was during my first 
semester at grad school, and I had um, with a one resident <laughs> and I went to Europe for a few months, and I met a few galleries. Okay. So we executed. This was done the night before there was an exhibition happening for um, I think it was International AIDS Day, and so someone I had asked me to take part you know, in exhibition. So I went in and actually that you know that evening took a bunch of pictures you know that evening, so portraits and. It's interesting because they don't have the formal qualities that I definitely relied on early on, but there was something that was a great thing in terms of like breaking out of the frame, um, the images in terms of um, breaking the actual <coughs> background itself, actually making it with the viewer aware that this is a construct. So I think it was similar in terms of really trying to, and it sort of like anticipated some, um, I would say this work right here, um, whereas my previous work, um, <laughs> A lot of my work is for issues of gender. It was very interesting when the New York Times had us, um, commissioned five of us, Nan Gold and you and I, I think Robert Frank, um, to do self portraits in anticipation of the election year. Mm -hmm. That it was very curious just to see that if my early work was exploring gender, that I, um, and particularly issues of okay, female gender, what does it mean to actually use the New York Times as a site to somehow to interrogate notions of masculinity? And this portrait right here was definitely much inspired by, um, equally traumatized by the um, the Luima case. You know, the I think Luima was from was Luima from he was Haitian. He was, um, was he Haitian. He was, you know, he had been obviously you know molested, you know, right. sodomized, you know, by the police. You know, so there was a lot of uh, goofy stuff in there. Um, some shakes and things in the lips and. I recall you, you and Brenda talking while this painting was being made in terms of like using different kinds of, like say, reds to deal with brown skin. So tell me, tell me about the choice of color. Well, it is, you it's think. really interesting. Uh, I just uh, I just finished painting uh, um, Kara Walker, and every time I paint a, a person of color, uh, first of all, I realize how boring our skin is. Uh, those of us who are pale. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I remember somebody had said, criticizing a program at a school, and they said, well, what's wrong with the graduate school? They said, it's too pale, too male, too stale, too Yale. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I have all of those things. It would be Yale, I'm Yale. And you'll have to decide if I'm stale. <laughs>
eyeballs just disappear. But in, uh, the more pigmentation there is in the skin, the more the daguerreotype plate loves uh, the image. And, uh, you know, obviously you weren't oiled up or anything yeah. like that. But whatever. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's the comment, you know, you, you often say to people, like, you know, slick them down before. <laughs> Not in this case, clearly. But, um, <laughs> but, but, but it, looks, uh, it looks like you're cast out of metal. Yeah, and that's quite, quite beautiful. I love it. It's a great, great detail. And there's another case when, when uh, Caucasians, we really look pasty. So the, my, my grandma, this is a portrait of my grandma, they saw the portrait I did of a few years before with my grandfather, and she was an um, extraordinary you know, figure in, in my life, and I remember when I photographed her and I was sharing with a good friend of mine, um, you know, Pamela Buchert, is that I, I, in a way, I realized that, that she might have lived much longer after, and it was just intense, just that, I mean, something about the photograph in terms of like, um, at once, is, you know, simultaneously sort of like it's an intimate experience at the same time was able to somehow um, kind of provide us from a distance. And it was just really, I remember like on her, on her deathbed, her saying to me, let's say, when are you get, you know, when are you going to do your book, you know? So this was a very, um, you know, very important um, session for me. So I'm just going to go through quickly. So the work, so 200 subjects um, ranging from my grandmother to um, Yoko Ono. And, um, I began the project in 98, and I've been fascinated by, you know, I've been doing portraits for many years, and it's just been really, um, I think I think what I'm really talking enough about is that I began this project in 98 on the heels of the Warden Hole um, show that I did in 96, which is a very challenging show. I'm going to just bring the details. You can look at this book, Blow Up, if you, if you want to see it. But I think it was, there was something about maybe the reaction I got to that particular body of work that, in a way that I actually came back the portraiture. And there was something about um, subversive, me, subversive to me about selecting subjects from a, a range of different subjects, whether people were poor, wealthy, black, white. If you think about historically photography, there were subjects of photography, and then there were, there were somehow objects of photography. If you think of ethnographic photography, or you know, like say, anthropological photography, and I was very much interested in using the same structure to <coughs> photograph people from different social economic backgrounds, etc. Or whether that's mystery you know, who dances for a dollar to let's say Aggie Gunn's granddaughter. So I was much I was very much interested in the collapsing of those kinds of positions, you know, in relationship to, you know, portraiture. So I'm just gonna go through several of these I have a couple of we, we we photographed a lot of the same people. Absolutely. Right?